Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. Okay. It's like just about everybody's here, which is wonderful. Okay, do me a favor and type your first name into chat for me. Um, and, and if you have a nickname, type that in for me. I forgot to ask last time um, if anybody had nicknames they would like me to use. Very good, thank you. Yeah, I'll ask you to do that um, when we get together on Zoom. I'll ask you to type your name into, into the chat. That's kind of a, an easy way for me to take attendance. Very good. Okay. Well, I hope everyone's having a good start to the day. Um, and I also hope everybody's had a chance to maybe take a, a look through our Canvas course and think about the things that we talked about last time. Um, today is sort of our first uh, laboratory because today we're gonna be doing a laboratory exercise in uh, biosafety, biosafety in the microbiology lab and really in laboratories in general. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about the compound light microscope, uh, which is the microscope that we use most often in a microbiology lab. Um, before we get started into the lab material for today, we do have a couple of housekeeping things to take care of. Um, I hope you saw the announcement that I sent out after our last uh, class on Monday. Uh, if you recall, some of your classmates were having trouble using the inbox function in Canvas, and I did a little investigative work and um, I think it's solved. Um, there are actually two choices for this class in the drop-down menu in the inbox. So when you click on which course you're trying to send a message through um, in the inbox on Canvas, there's actually two choices. There's one for a course numbered 30039 and one for 30040. You're going to want to use the 30039. That's the course number that applies directly to our course. That second course number is more of an administrative thing on my end, and you don't need to click on that one. Um, there's actually nothing there. There's nothing there. Um, you won't see anybody's names. You won't see my name. So, so hopefully that clears that up for us. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention when we were together last time uh, relates just to uh, Zoom and uh, really to um, the technology of this course in general. Um, if you ever come on a Monday or a Wednesday morning and you check in and, um, and I'm not here, um, I would ask that you give me 10 minutes. Give me till 10 after nine. So just sit patiently try to relax. And um, if I don't come into our meeting by 10 after nine, you're free to go. Um, there's something has happened on my end and I can't remedy it. Um, at 10 after nine, if I haven't started our meeting, you're free to just go, go about your day and look for an announcement. I'll send out an announcement to explain why I didn't attend. Um, Sometimes Zoom does weird things, as I'm sure you all have experienced at one time or another. Um, and sometimes it does take me a bit to get it going in the morning. So um, we may be a few minutes late periodically. Um, again, um, give me a few minutes. Give me 10 minutes to get things started. And if it doesn't start by then, you're free to just check, off, check out of Zoom um, and go about your day. Um, the other um, thing I wanted to mention was I had a couple of uh, messages from your classmates that I think um, I'll share 
with everybody because they were good questions. Um, I got a, a, a message asking how, um, how I should be addressed um, in, the, in our meetings. Um, that's a great question. I get that one a lot from students. Um, what I'll say is, uh, and this applies to all of your instructors, not just me. Um, when you're addressing an instructor in the classroom, you wanna be um, as respectful as possible. Um, sometimes your instructors will um, tell you to address them by their first name. Um, sometimes they won't. Um, your best bet, whenever you're addressing an instructor, is to use their formal, their formal name or their formal title. Um, if you're not sure, if you're not sure what their title is, if you're not sure if they're a Mr. or a Mrs. or a Ms. Or, or something else, a doctor, if you're not sure, it's perfectly appropriate to refer to an instructor as professor. That's a very uh, considered a very respectful thing. So if you're ever unsure of what one of your instructors wants to be called, just call them professor. Um, very polite. That's considered very polite. Um, so for me personally, as I said, my name is Dr. Piscopo. A lot of my students call me Dr. P because my last name is a little bit hard to pronounce. <laughs> um, so you're going to notice through the semester that I usually sign off on announcements and, and email messages and things as Dr. P. Um, and, and I'm perfectly comfortable with that. But you are also free to call me professor. Um, I think that's perfectly respectable. It just delineates for us in the classroom who the instructor is versus who the uh, learners are, who the students are. Um, and that's generally why we prefer to keep things a little bit more formal um, in the classroom. Uh, oh, and the other question I got, which is a great one, is what do I do if I have a question during the lab? Like, what should I do? <laughs> um, where I make heavy use of the chat. I like the chat. I think it's easy to use. Um, it kind of keeps people um, from needing to speak um, if they're uncomfortable with that. Um, I can see um, a couple of you are having problems with, uh, with me freezing on your screen. I apologize for that. Hopefully things will smooth out. Um, if you have a question, why don't we do this? Why don't we have you type the word question into the chat? Just type out the word question while I'm speaking during lab and that will be my signal to stop and call on you, okay? That's probably easier than um, any other options that we have, such as you literally raising your hand or something. Um, if you type the, the word question out into chat, I should be able to see that quickly and address what your question is. Remember, it's really important in a class like this that you feel free to ask questions and to make comments because the more you engage with the material, um, the more you tend to pick up, the more you tend to learn. Um, so always, always feel free to ask questions while we're together, okay? So having said that, does anybody have any questions about what we talked about the last time we were together? Does anybody have any questions about the syllabus or the schedule that we have in, in front of us for the summer? Does anybody have any questions about how the course is organized on Canvas? Uh, when you have assignments due? Anything like that? I have a question. Yes. Um, so the homework in the lab, does that need to be done in one sitting or can you pause and will the system save the information? That's a great question. The homework for the lab, you can only submit one time. The system will not 
allow you to go back in multiple times. Um, what you'll have to do then is wait until we've had both laboratory exercises before you sit down to complete those questions. And you'll wanna make sure, just like with the lecture quizzes, that you have your laboratory notes with you. Now, once you open those laboratory questions on Canvas, you can take as long as you want to answer them. You can sit for 20 minutes, you can sit for three hours. But once you submit, you've submitted it, okay? Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. And uh, Crystal, was, does Crystal have a question? Was that Crystal who just a asked a question? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I have a question. How do you know how many questions are going to be on the quizzes roughly around? Um, yes. Generally, there's uh, on a lecture quiz, you can expect between five and 10 questions, depending on the topic that we're doing. For the laboratory, it's closer to 10. Most weeks, it'll be closer to 10 than five. But I usually don't put more than 10 questions on any sort of um, homework assignment. Um, there are also, you'll also find that there are times when um, a question asks for multiple answers. And what I do is I go through those once they've been submitted, I go through them by hand. And I often give students partial credit back if they've answered some of the things correctly and not other things, um, I will uh, give partial credit for those answers. So if you ever take a quiz and Canvas will automatically give you a grade based on the questions that are multiple choice, remember that any essay question on a quiz, I have to grade by hand. So let's say you submit a quiz and it has five questions on it and you get a score of two. Remember, that's not your final score because I have to go through and grade any essay questions that might be on it. I have to go through and maybe award partial credit for it. So don't, um, don't ever panic if it looks like you did terribly on a quiz until I've gone through and uh, double checked the grade. I go through every quiz and every homework by hand after Canvas um, grades it. Canvas will grade multiple choice questions, but it is obviously unable to grade any essay questions. Those have to be graded by the instructor. All right, very good. I think that was all I needed to speak to you about. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna share my screen with you now. I'm just gonna pull up our uh, Canvas course, our homepage. If you'll just bear with me for a minute. Let me get rid of this. Okay. So hopefully you should be seeing on your screen our homepage and says River Valley Community College in big letters right in the middle. Remember, when you come into Canvas, you're going to want to click where it says modules over here on the left. I'm going to go ahead and click that. We're in week one, so I'm going to scroll down to week one. Remember, in each weekly module, there's going to be a to do list for you. There's gonna be the lecture material sort of all uh, grouped together. And there's gonna be the laboratory material all grouped together. So if I click on our to-do list here, each week I'm gonna remind you which lectures you need to watch for that week, whether or not you have lecture quizzes to complete and when those are due. And then I'll, um, speak about um, what we'll be doing in laboratory 
for Wednesday's Zoom Lab, which is today, we're going to talk about biosafety and care and use of microscopes. And there'll be homework to complete for the lab, which is due by Sunday at midnight, or prior to Sunday at midnight, I should say. So remember, make use of these to-do lists. They're there for you. They're there to help you organize your time and also make sure that you've done everything that you need to do for the week. So if I scroll down to the laboratory area, you can see for Wednesday's lab, here are the slides that I'm gonna be using this morning for the biosafety material. You'll notice there's also um, a file here called Microscopy Tutorial Worksheet. I just put this in last night this is um, a handy, I think, a very handy little reference guide for students referring to how to properly handle and use a light microscope. If you don't have a lot of experience using a light microscope, this is a very basic, very um, detailed guide in terms of how do I carry it? Uh, what are the pieces and parts of the microscope? And what do they do? And how do I focus a microscope? How do I take a slide, put it on a microscope and bring it into focus? All of those things are included in this worksheet for you. And then finally, here's the laboratory homework associated with today's lab. Um, and that's due again by Sunday at midnight, okay? So for the first couple of weeks, we'll do this. We'll walk through the module together just to make sure everybody has everybody's um, on board on how to how to approach each week to week um, each week to week uh, group of material in terms of lecture and lab. All right. So um, we all come into this course uh, with different experiences. We have different experiences in terms of any schooling that we've had um, above high school. We come with different experiences in terms of our work experience, whether or not you've worked in a healthcare setting or some other um, type of laboratory setting before, whether or not you've um, had experience handling equipment, um, everybody comes in with a different amount of experience. So we start the laboratory, the laboratory um, sessions, we start with this biosafety exercise because it's important that we all sort of get to the same foundational level of understanding about the risks and hazards associated with working, again, in any laboratory. And since most of us will be going on to have jobs in the healthcare sector, most of us will go on to have jobs in a clinical atmosphere, it's important that we know how to behave in laboratories in order to keep ourselves safe. Now, I'm going to focus primarily on the microbiology laboratory because it has its own unique hazards. But even if you're a person that will never work in a laboratory, if you're never actually going to be working your day-to-day -day job in the laboratory, you will be walking into and walking out of laboratories as part of your job. You may be delivering uh, samples to a laboratory. You may be picking up results from the laboratory. And um, it's very helpful for all of us to have an understanding of what the rules are in laboratories and why we have those rules. It's important that we know these things because that's how we stay safe. Um, so that's what we're gonna be starting off today with is a little bit of a lesson about biosafety. Now, biosafety is sort of near and dear to my heart because in addition to working um, in many different laboratories, both when I was um, practicing veterinary medicine and also when I was uh, working as a scientist, a PhD scientist, um, part of my responsibilities at Keene State College were to ensure that biosafety um, 
mechanisms were in place in laboratories. So um, I don't have the, uh, I don't do this work anymore, but I used to be what's called a chemical hygiene officer at Keene State College, in addition to my teaching responsibilities. So it's sort of a subject that's near and dear to my heart because I really do believe in the importance of safety. Um, too many people get um, injured in laboratories and um, it's because people don't have a general understanding of what's happening in the lab and how it might be hazardous to them. So I'm gonna share my screen now and you should be seeing the title slide for this exercise called Biosafety in the Microbiology Laboratory. Now remember, you have access to these slides in Canvas. So you don't have to sit here this morning and write down both everything that's on the slide and everything I'm saying. You don't need to do that. In fact, I'd rather you didn't because that's gonna be a difficult exercise and it's gonna inhibit you being able to listen. So remember, anything that's on the slide, you don't need to write down. We're just gonna to wanna to write down extra things that I might be saying, okay? Remember too, there's a feature in PowerPoint. Below every slide, there's a space where we can type in notes for ourselves, okay? So keep that in mind. That's available to you as well. Just erase that. Whatever makes your life easier, whatever makes your life easier, that's what I want you to do. Now, believe it or not, you can get a lot of information about what happens in a laboratory space, including a microbiology laboratory, before you step foot into the room. And that's because on every working laboratory door, there's one of these, one of these diamond shaped diagrams. Okay, this is called an NFPA label. And what it does is it provides universal, universal code for what's happening in the laboratory in terms of hazards. Okay, so this diamond has four colored boxes on it. The red box is telling us if there are any fire hazards in the laboratory. The yellow is telling us if there are any chemicals in use that are particularly unstable. The white box tells us, tells us if there are any unusual hazards, very specific hazards. And the blue box tells us if there are any, any chemicals or things in use in the lab that are hazardous to our health. The way the uh, diamond, the NFPA diamond is used is that numbers are placed in each one of these boxes to indicate the level of hazard. Now you can see in the diagram here that I've provided that there are very specific definitions for each number. For example, the fire hazard talks about actual temperatures. Don't worry about that information. What I want you to know is that the number in the box means something is more hazardous if the number is higher and less hazardous if the number is lower. So if you see a zero in the fire hazard box, what they're telling you is that there's nothing in that laboratory that is going to, um, that is going to be a particular fire hazard to you. If there's a zero, in the blue box, there's nothing in that laboratory that presents a particular, a particularly dangerous health hazard to you, okay? So the lower the number, the lesser the hazard. Now, let me just re uh, enlarge this a little bit. I think the hardest box to interpret sometimes when you're walking by a lab is the white box, these specific hazard boxes. And that's because this is the one box where you won't see a number if there's a hazard present. Instead, you're gonna see a symbol. So you can see the list of symbols right here. 
you might see an OX here. If there's a particularly strong oxidizer chemical, you might see COR here. If there's a chemical in use that is particularly corrosive, you might see the radioactive symbol if that hazard is present. So the white box is the only one that I think is difficult to interpret. The general rule that I use is if you see something in the white box, if you see a symbol in the white box, uh, take note of it. Take note of it because that means that there are things in that laboratory that are particularly hazardous and they have very special hazards associated with them. There are chemicals, for example, that will ignite when they're exposed to air. There are chemicals that um, are particularly acidic. And if they came in contact with the skin, they would do serious and lasting damage. So again, what's important to know about the NFPA diamond is that it's there for you. It's there so that you know, before you step into that room, what kind of work is being done in there and what kind of hazards those people are handling. Again, if you're just gonna go in and out of that lab, you're just delivering something to the lab, it's still good to know what the hazards are, but it's not quite the same as if you are working in that laboratory. But know what you're facing, know what's going on in your laboratory um, before you enter. Again, these NFPA diamonds, these are universally applied. So any laboratory space, whether it's a clinical laboratory or a research laboratory, this NFPA diamond sign should be right on the door or on the wall next to the door, okay? And again, it's there to alert the workers what they're exposing themselves to. Now you'll see that second on the list over here on the left is no food or drink. And I've got that in big letters. Uh, this is also a universal, a universal rule in laboratories. We don't eat and drink in laboratory spaces. I hope that the reason behind that is pretty obvious. Um, we use hazardous things in laboratories. We use chemicals and in a microbiology lab, we're handling living organisms. So it's just not safe. It is not safe to eat and drink in a laboratory. Now, let me tell you of all of the lab rules, of all of the rules that apply to laboratories, this is the one that gets broken most often. And I think people start to get a sense of comfort in the laboratory. They start to think, well, it's not really that dangerous. And so they start to break the rule a little bit. Um, it's not safe to eat or drink in a laboratory space. You are risking your health when you do that. Okay. So we always have um, a, an alternative place for laboratory workers and students to go when they wanna have a bite to eat or they wanna get a drink um, and it's not in the laboratory. The other one that's below this relates to it, but you may not think about this one as much. It says, don't apply makeup, don't apply lip balm while you're in the laboratory. This is related to no eating and drinking. Remember your mouth, your nose and your eyes are primary places for dangerous microbes to enter your body, mouth, nose, eyes. So if you're taking out, let's say some lipstick or lip balm, or maybe you're taking out um, a makeup brush to sort of fix your eye makeup a little bit, um, you're doing two things. Number one, you're exposing that makeup to potentially to something in the lab, but you're also um, handling up near your face and you are potentially exposing yourself to microbes. So those are things we just don't do. If you need to touch up your makeup, if you need to touch up your lip balm or anything like that, just step out of the laboratory, step into the restroom and take care of it in there. In general, we don't handle our mouth, our nose, our eyes while we're working in the lab. Just try very hard to get out of the habit 
of touching your face. Now, this is a hard one. I know for me, this is one I struggle with because I tend to touch my glasses. I do it a lot. I tend to do this. And um, it's not a good idea. Um, while I'm working with microbes, with gloved hands, um, I am potentially contaminated. And if I touch my glasses with my contaminated gloves, I have now contaminated my glasses. So try not to touch, try not to do this and, and this and whatever else we all tend to do all day. Um, even your hair, your hair shouldn't be handled while you're working in the laboratory. Okay, that's not good practice. Try to keep your hands away from your face. Use gloves correctly. We're gonna talk a little bit more about gloves in just a minute. So I'm just gonna leave that one for now. But next on the list is make sure that you manage your waste correctly. This is another one that's near, or near and dear to my heart because this is another one that tends to be broken quite a bit. All of the materials that we use in laboratory have very particular hazards associated with them. And every container, every container that we handle, we have to think about what's in it before we throw it away. Now, there are certainly things that can go right in the trash can, right in the regular trash can, but there are other things that are too hazardous for that method of disposal. And it's up to us as the people who are using those materials to know the correct way to dispose of them. It's very important that we don't put things down drains that are hazardous to human life, animal life, or the environment in general. Remember, what you put down the drain is gonna end up in the environment somewhere. So always know exactly how liquid waste needs to be disposed of. A lot of the liquids that we use in the microbiology lab are stains. We use them to stain cells so that we can look at them under the microscope. And all of those stains have to be disposed of in waste bottles. We dump the extra stain, the used stain, into a waste bottle that is then picked up by a hazardous materials disposal company so that that waste can be um, disposed of correctly and not go down the drain. We, of course, also handle living things in the microbiology lab. And we use um, an autoclave. We use a machine called an autoclave which sterilizes those living things. It kills them before they're disposed of. We would never want to send a microbe out of the lab in a trash can because that is potentially hazardous to someone who might come in contact with that trash. So again, what's important is that you know what you're handling so you know how to dispose of it. Here's another really important one. It might seem obvious to you, but it's important that we always practice this. It's important that we wash our hands. Hopefully, as we've come through the pandemic, we've all gotten a little better with this. But in the microbiology lab, we wash our hands when we arrive and we wash our hands before we leave. So we take off, we take off of our hands any microbes that we might have come in with. And that's when we arrive in the morning. And then before we leave in the evening, we wash again because we don't want to carry any microbes home with us. So very, very common um, practice. Wash your hands when you get to work. Wash your hands before you leave. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a chance to practice some of these things this semester, but I'm gonna talk about them anyway, because again, depending on what you wanna do when you graduate, depending on what you wanna do for your uh, working life, you may find yourself in laboratory spaces. And there are certain things that everybody needs to do, whether you're in a microbiology lab or not. 
So when we arrive at work, we put our personal items away. We put them away from whatever workspace we're going to be at. In other words, you don't put your purse on your workbench. You don't put your lunchbox on your workbench or your backpack or your coat or your gloves. All of those things need to be placed in a, in a dedicated space for personal items. Um, every laboratory has a space set aside for workers to put their personal things. The next thing we have to do, remember we said, we're gonna wash our hands when we get there, but then we're gonna wash our workplace. And we're gonna do even more than washing it. We're gonna disinfect it. We do this every single day. We disinfect our workplace. Now, there are two commonly used disinfectants in microbiology labs. One of them is alcohol, and the other one is chlorine bleach. Now you'll notice there are different kinds of alcohol that are used. They're all equally effective. It just depends on the preference of the person running the laboratory. So you can use ethanol, you can use isopropyl alcohol, you can use whatever kind of alcohol you want, but, but it has to be diluted. 60 to 90% dilution. That surprises people when you tell them that. That surprises them because it's sort of human nature for us to assume that the stronger the alcohol is, the more effective it is. Now we're gonna talk about disinfectants later in the, in the summer term, but for now understand that by diluting the alcohol with water, we actually make it more effective as a disinfectant as an agent that's capable of destroying microbes. So between 60 and 90% is appropriate. And I can tell you from my experience, most laboratories use a 70%, a 70% alcohol solution. We spray that solution on our desktop and then we wipe it and allow it to dry. Now the chlorine bleach is diluted even more than that. The chlorine bleach is diluted down to 10%. So there's only 10% bleach in that spray bottle if that's the disinfectant you're using in your lab. Again, you might think stronger, stronger bleach will be more effective, but that's not the case you need to have a 10% solution in order to make it most effective at killing microbes. Now, both of those, both alcohol and chlorine bleach are excellent disinfectants because they're very rapidly, rapidly bactericidal. They are very rapidly able to kill microbial cells. The use of one or the other just depends on which laboratory you're in. Um, I know from my experience, I prefer alcohol. And the reason is <laughs> because I always manage, always manage to get the bleach solution on my clothing. Every time I spray down a desktop with bleach, I always manage to get a little bit of the spray on my clothing. And as you know, bleach will discolor clothing. So personally, I prefer alcohol. But unfortunately, alcohol is very expensive and bleach is not, bleach is cheap. So depending on the uh, laboratory you're working in, you'll, they'll be using one or the other as their general disinfectant. Now, before we get started every day, we gather what we need. It's important that we, manage, uh, that we manage our workplace in the laboratory. And that means that we don't wanna be walking around the laboratory searching for supplies while we're trying to get work done. So we determine what our job is for the day, what particular work we're going to be doing, and we gather all of our supplies before we get started. It's important that we know exactly what's in front of us at all times so that we don't accidentally grab one vial when we intend to grab a different vial. 
Um, and that leads us to the next thing, which is everything has to be labeled and labeled thoroughly. This includes all of the chemical containers that we're using, any of the cultures that we're handling. And, and by culture, I mean a container that is um, used to purposefully grow microbes in it, um, any slides that we're preparing for the microscope, anything that we are handling has to be labeled. Now, this is a list of things I want us to know, and that's what belongs on the label of a microbial culture. You're gonna to wanna to make sure that your name or your initials are somewhere on that container. Now by container, I mean either a Petri dish or some kind of a tube or a flask that we're growing microbes in. Your a name or your initials should be on that container. The date that that, that that container was created should be listed. The name of the organism that's growing in that container needs to be on there. And the name of the particular medium that the microbes are growing in should be on the container. We're gonna be talking about culture media a lot this summer. We have, we have lots, dozens, dozens of different um, liquid broths as we call them that we use to grow different types of bacteria. And each type of broth has different nutrients in it or um, other types of chemicals that help microbes grow. It's important that we label on the container what kind of a medium it is, because some of these look identical. A lot of liquid broth in the microbiology lab has a brownish beige color to it. So it's important that we label what kind of material those microbes are growing in, what kind of a medium it is. Now, sometimes students will say to me in the laboratory, I made this container. I know what kind of medium this is. So why do I have to write it down on the container? And the answer is, because in a working laboratory, you are never working alone. There are gonna be other people in that laboratory. You are gonna share things like incubators and refrigerators. And it's important that anyone, anyone who encounters that container know exactly what's in it. And this goes back to reducing risk and reducing hazards. If you work in a laboratory that handles hazardous microbes, pathogens, microbes that are capable of causing disease, it's critical that everyone that is in that laboratory knows exactly what is growing in each and every container. Sometimes when you go into the incubator, for example, you have to move culture containers around. You have to move them around so you can fit more in. And if you've got a particularly dangerous pathogen in there, you need to alert everyone by showing them the name of the pathogen and what that pathogen is growing in inside that container. Labeling is so important. It needs to become second nature to us. It needs to be second nature that if you're making a slide or you're putting together a culture container, or you're putting together some other um, material in the laboratory that has microbes in it, it needs to be second nature that you label that. And of course, the reason we put our names on it is so if there's any questions about that container, people in the laboratory know who to ask. So always your initials, the date that you made the container, just in case you forget about it, just in case you forget about it. And a few months later, somebody finds it in the fridge. <laughs> the name of the organism that's growing and the name of the medium. All right, that little alarm that you heard is our, um, our signal that it's time to take a break. So we're gonna take a five minute break. 
and I'll see you at 9.50. Okay, everybody, go grab a cup of coffee, <laughs> do whatever you need to do, stretch, and I'll see you in a minute. Professor Piscopo, can you hear yes. me okay? Yes, I it's, can. It's Sapna. For some reason, my video on my laptop doesn't work. So I usually log in on my phone really quick so you can see me. Oh, good. And then I just and then I just shut my phone off. But that's why I can't. I'm I don't know what's going on with my camera. But I had a question I emailed you. I finally figured out how to email you regarding next week's lab. Yes. And the week after. So I just wanted to let you know there's an email in there in your inbox. And then okay. we can just go from there. No problem. Thanks for letting me know. And okay, I'm sorry thanks. about, I'm sorry you're having trouble with your camera. Oh yeah. I don't know what it is. I don't know if I need a new laptop or what, but it's all good. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> all right. Thanks. See you in a moment. Okay.
All right, everybody. Go ahead and just quickly type your first name into chat for me or your nickname. Thank you. I hope my animals aren't, I hope my birds aren't too loud for us today. Um, I have three, I have three uh, budgies. And sometimes when they hear me talking, um, they like to join in. So if you hear them squeaking and squawking, that's what they're doing. <laughs> I also have two dogs, two large dogs. And every once in a while, they will chime in because they hear someone uh, package delivery or something. So hopefully that won't happen too much. My dogs think they are um, policemen for the neighborhood. Yeah, they like to alert the entire neighborhood if anyone is, you know, if they don't recognize someone. So. <laughs> All right. All right, so let's jump back in here. Okay. So a couple of general words now about what we call good lab hygiene. Again, this applies to any laboratory space, but especially in the microbiology lab. Remember we said personal materials have to be kept away from your workspace. Um, of course, you wanna wear appropriate clothing, appropriate jewelry. You wanna make sure that you have uh, good uh, shoes on that don't expose your feet too much, no sandals, no flip-flops in a laboratory. You need to manage your hair. If you have long hair like I do, it needs to be pulled back away from, um, away from your workspace. And you really, really have to respect any sources of fire. Um, every year in the the literature, the biosafety literature. Um, there are stories about people who lose their lives um, in working laboratory spaces because they set themselves on fire. And I know that sounds crazy, but it still happens, it happens. Um, a lot of times, unfortunately, the hair is the source. Um, when your hair catches on fire, it, it will set your clothing on fire and um, it's horrific when it does happen. Uh, there, like I said earlier, there are chemicals that can spontaneously combust in laboratories. That's also another source um, of fire-related injury. Now, in the microbiology lab, depending on the lab you're working in, you may be working with a Bunsen burner with an open flame because we have to sterilize the tools that we use as we move bacteria from place to place. In many labs now, you will find what's called an incinerator instead of a Bunsen burner. And uh, we'll be looking at incinerators later in the summer. This is a device that heats up to a very high temperature, but it doesn't have an open flame associated with it. So we can still achieve sterilization of our tools without having the hazard of an open flame but many laboratories still use Bunsen burners. And it's just critically important that we don't introduce any unnecessary hazards when we're using a Bunsen burner. So when you're choosing clothing that you wear at work, now some laboratories will provide you with clothing. They'll provide you with scrubs or they'll provide you with a laboratory coat that you are to wear at work, but some don't. And so you want to avoid wearing, for example, shirts that have very open flowing sleeves that you might accidentally drag across an open flame. You want to avoid wearing um, long scarves, blousy scarves that could catch fire. Um, you want to keep your clothing as close to your body as possible when you're at work. If fire is part of your job, if open flame is part of your job. Okay. Now, when it comes to PPE or personal protective equipment in the microbiology lab, it varies tremendously from lab to lab. 
like I said, some laboratory spaces will ask you to wear a lab, a lab coat when you're at work, but some don't. Um, some places require workers to wear goggles or face masks, but generally only when it's um, especially hazardous. In other words, you're working with particularly hazardous microbes. And um, we'll be talking about this BSL designation in just a minute. The one thing that you will always be asked to wear in a microbiology laboratory is gloves, always. We don't handle microbes with bare hands. Um, critically, um, these gloves have to be worn appropriately. Um, they have to be put on and taken off correctly. Um, they have to, once they're on, they have to be treated as though they are contaminated. Um, sometimes that confuses students. Um, if they put on a pair of gloves, they want to just be able to touch their cell phone. And if I, you know, shake a finger at them, I remind them that when your gloves are on, you should imagine that they are contaminated, even if you know that they're not. So the general rule is once your gloves are on, you don't handle anything that you are not going to then disinfect at the end of the day. You don't handle anything that is not routinely disinfected. So you're not gonna touch your cell phone, you're not gonna touch your hair, you're not gonna touch um, your microscope with your gloves on because those things do not get routinely disinfected. Treat gloves as though they are contaminated if you're wearing them. The other kinds of PPE, again, um, face masks, um, goggles, anything like that, it's gonna vary. It's gonna vary by the laboratory you're in, but the gloves will always be there. Something else important to know is this, you don't reuse these gloves. These gloves are considered single use. So if you need to handle your cell phone or you need to touch a doorknob, gloves come off and then you will put on a fresh pair when you're ready to get back to work. We don't leave laboratories with our gloves on, okay? You don't run to the restroom with your gloves on. If you're leaving the laboratory space, gloves have to come off. Now, something else that's important to know, and again, this is similar to knowing what hazards are in a laboratory. You need to know where safety equipment is. Um, unfortunately, I, I'm going to guess eight out of 10, eight out of 10 laboratory workers can't tell you where the fire extinguisher, where the fire extinguisher is in their lab. They can't tell you, they can't point to the eyewash station or the emergency shower. Um, many people don't even know where the first aid kit is. These are things that are found standard in most uh, laboratories. In 2022, if a laboratory works with flame at all, there's gonna be an emergency shower somewhere in that laboratory. And if you're not familiar with these, when you pull the handle down, um, an enormous amount of water comes out of these showers. So they are ideal, ideal for a person who has accidentally set themselves on fire. Now, the problem with it is that in an emergency, in a moment of emergency, when we're all panicked because that's our normal response if you don't know where the emergency shower is it's a problem you have to know where it is beforehand so that if your uh, co-worker accidentally sets themselves on fire you can push them quickly to the shower um, there was a terrible case several years ago now it was probably a decade now there was a terrible case in California of a graduate student who was working in a laboratory after hours. She did have other people in the lab with her and she was working with a chemical that ignited when it gets exposed to the air. She accidentally exposed it to the air and she set herself on fire. And her laboratory coworkers froze. They just froze. Um, within about a minute or two, somebody started grabbing beakers full of water and sort of tossing them at her. But that was it. 
there was an emergency shower in that room, but nobody knew where it was. And of course that woman, she died. She went to the hospital, she was horrifically burned and she died because, because the people around her weren't aware where safety equipment was. So you always need to know what, which lab you're going in because you know sometimes we work in multiple labs. You need to know where all the safety equipment is. Where's the fire extinguisher? Where's the first aid kit? Where are these things located? Uh, we talked about the gloves. Here's something else to remember. When we're working in the microbiology lab, what we're doing most of the time is we're trying to grow cultures of microbes that we are interested in. If we're in a diagnostic laboratory, we're using a sample that we obtained from a patient and we wanna know what kind of microbes are in that sample. We wanna know what is in that patient's body. So we're trying to grow those microbes very particularly. If we're in a research laboratory, we might be trying to grow a particular microbe so we can study it. We work hard to grow these cultures so we don't wanna do anything to contaminate them. We don't wanna um, allow any additional microbes to get into those cultures and contaminate them. That's one of two um, primary considerations in a microbiology lab. We don't wanna contaminate our cultures. Unfortunately, we are covered in microbes. And of course, we talk about this in this week's lecture. We talk about the fact that the human body is covered in microbes. It's normal for us to be covered in microbes. The environment is also full of microbes. And pure laboratory cultures, pure laboratory cultures are full of microbes. We are purposefully growing them. So the problem is how do we keep our cultures? How do we keep them from getting contaminated? And how do we keep ourselves from getting contaminated with what we're working on? Those are the two most important things to keep in mind when you're working in a laboratory that handles microbes. Don't, don't do anything that's gonna contaminate the culture that you're growing or the diagnostic sample that you're handling. Don't do anything to contaminate that with yourself. In other words, don't let the microbes that are on you get into those cultures. And second, don't contaminate yourself with the things that you're growing. Don't contaminate yourself with the culture or the diagnostic sample. Two things. Don't contaminate the things you're trying to grow with yourself. <laughs> and don't contaminate yourself with the things you're trying to grow. And if you can keep those two things in mind, every day while you're working, you'll be in really good shape. <clears throat> All right, any questions about what I've said so far? Most of what I've said so far is very um, sort of generalized information, again, can be applied to most laboratory spaces. Any questions at all? All right, very good. The next thing I wanna talk about is much more specific to microbiology work. And that's what are called biosafety levels or BSLs. When laboratory work involves living organisms, so again, the microbiology lab, there are international standards that are applied to help keep the people working in the lab safe and to help keep the general public safe. And that's what are called biosafety levels or BSL levels. Now, there are four levels from BSL one to BSL four. Again, the lower the number, the less the hazard. So BSL-1 is a laboratory that has the lowest level of hazard. 
So the lowest level of particular biosafety being used. Teaching laboratories, for example, laboratories in colleges and universities, they are at BSL-1. BSL-4 is the very highest level of hazard, so it has the highest level of biosafety. And uh, laboratories that handle the most dangerous pathogens are kept at the BSL-4 level. In a BSL-1 laboratory, we use standard lab safety practices. So the PPE, like we said, is gonna vary. Um, everybody's gonna wear gloves when they're handling microbes, but all other forms of PPE are gonna vary depending on the particular lab. There's a very low level of hazard, so we use a lower level of biosafety. And again, all teaching laboratories are at BSL-1. In a BSL-2 laboratory, we follow all of the BSL-1 safety regulations plus a few additional measures. And I've got them listed here. In a BSL-2 lab, microbes are being grown in that lab that are non-respiratory pathogens. And there are treatments and or vaccines available for those microbes. So for example, a laboratory that is handling, let's say the cholera pathogen. That's a pathogen, that's a human pathogen. It causes disease in humans, but, but it's not a respiratory pathogen. And there are treatments available should the worst happen and someone get um, exposed to and infected with the cholera pathogen. So it's a, it's a higher level of concern. It's a higher level of hazard than a BSL-1 laboratory, but because it's non-respiratory and because there are treatments available, it doesn't have to be that much higher. Now let's look at some of the other conditions in a BSL-2 lab. Limited access. That means that people can't just walk in and out of this lab. Sometimes you have to have, um, you know, your identification card. Um, that's one of my dogs. Sometimes you have to swipe your ID card. Sometimes you have to know a code to punch in at the door but we're not gonna allow just anybody to come into this laboratory. They're gonna be using biological hoods. These are pieces of equipment that provide a working space that is ventilated. And it's similar to a chemical hood. If you've ever uh, worked in a hood in a chemistry lab, it's a little bit different though, because it's designed for biological organisms. You have to have particularly uh, carefully manage managed sharps containers. These sharps containers, like all sharps containers, are gonna have sharp things in them like uh, used needles or razor blades or other sharp materials, but they're also contaminated with potentially hazardous organisms. There are particular decontamination procedures in place for the waste material for the cultures that you're done with, for example. They generally require more PPE in a BSL-2 lab. They're a little stricter. Oops, sorry, somebody's got a mic on. <laughs> Just double check that you don't accidentally have your microphone on if you would. I can tell you at Keene State College, we have a couple of BSL-2 laboratories. Um, in one of the laboratories, they work with um, a Vibrio type of bacteria. Vibrio is a genus name, and the Vibrio organisms are pathogenic to humans, but they cause a non-respiratory kind of illness. In another of the laboratories, they handle the organism that uh, causes cholera. So we do have BSL-2 laboratories um, found in university settings. Now, a BSL-3 level laboratory is much more serious. They're gonna follow all of the BSL-2 rules, plus they're gonna have much more controlled access. These people are gonna be wearing more extensive PPE. 
generally full body PPE. So they're gowned, they're gloved, they have um, some kind of a face shield or goggles on masking. They're gonna have particular decontamination procedures in place um, when they exit the laboratory. These are laboratories that are handling respiratory pathogens. So bacteria or viruses that can cause respiratory disease in humans. But again, there are treatments or vaccines available. So just in case the worst happens and one of the workers gets infected, they have a treatment or a vaccine available for them. Now, the difference between BSL-3 and BSL-4 is that. In a BSL-4 laboratory, you're handling some kind of a pathogen that has no treatment available, no vaccine available, and you're handling a respiratory pathogen. You'll notice that the PPE is as extensive as it gets. Full body, air supplied, positive pressure clothing. I'll show you a picture of this in a minute. But this means that the person is wearing a suit that has its own air supply. They are not breathing room air when they're wearing the suit. They have to be decontaminated uh, fully when they exit the laboratory because they are handling some of the most da dangerous pathogens that we know of, including brand new pathogens or novel pathogens. When the SARS-CoV-2 virus first became pandemic and researchers needed to get it into the laboratory to study it, it was first brought into BSL-4 level laboratories because it was a novel virus, this virus that causes COVID-19. It was a novel virus, so new, and it caused a respiratory disease, at least what we knew of in the beginning, it caused a respiratory disease. So it was only handled in BSL-4 laboratories. Now there are several BSL-4 laboratories in our country, but only several. We do have a couple of BSL-4 laboratories in the New England area, including down uh, in Boston. These laboratories are kind of spectacular because they have to be housed in a separate building. So they cannot be part of the rest of the building. They have to have their own separate entrance and exit in a separate building. People have to be fully enclosed in a self-contained sort of environment with the suits they wear. And um, you better believe the access to those labs is tightly, tightly controlled. Now, once a vaccine became available for SARS-CoV-2, we could then handle that virus in BSL-3 laboratories. So now, now in the 2022, there are BSL-3 laboratories that are working with SARS-CoV-2. And there are many more of them in our country um, than BSL-4 laboratories. Now, when you're reviewing this material before our first lab practical, I don't need you to memorize the lists of things about these different levels of biosafety. What I need you to know is that BSL-1 is the lowest level of hazard, so it has the lowest level of restrictions applied to it, and it goes up from there. I need you to know that BSL-1 and BSL-2 labs don't handle any respiratory pathogens. BSL-3 and 4 do handle respiratory pathogens, okay? And I'd like you to know that the BSL-4 laboratories require the greatest amount of PPE. Those people are in self-contained um, environments. They're wearing a suit that puts them in an entirely separate environment than the rest of the laboratory. Let's take a look at some pictures. I love pictures. This young lady over here on the left is working in a BSL-1 laboratory. So this could be a teaching laboratory. Let's take a look. She's got her hair pulled back, excellent. 
She's got gloves on because we always wear gloves, but she doesn't have any other particular PPE on. It looks like she's wearing uh, maybe some scrubs that were supplied by her work. Um, she's got her workplace here on a desktop. She's got all of her equipment sort of around her. Everything looks pretty good here for BSL-1. Over here, this woman is in a BSL-2 laboratory. This is what I mean by a biological hood. You'll notice that this piece of equipment, it provides a workspace for her, but there's a glass door between her and the workspace. This door gets pulled down so that there's only a few inches of space that she can slide her hands under. What a biological cabinet creates is a sterile work surface. The way that the air circulates in that cabinet, it keeps that work surface sterile. It's not the same as a chemical hood. A chemical hood draws fumes away. A biological hood creates a sterile workplace. Okay. Now, there is something about this picture that mm, is a little problematic. Is there anything that you can see? Type it in the chat if you see it. Anything that you can see that this young lady isn't doing correctly? Let's take a look again. Anything trouble you about her? Type it into the chat. Hmm, she's got a lab coat on, she's got gloves on. She's working in a hood. Yeah, Maddie's got it. Casey's got it, Lisa's got it. Her hair is down. Oh, let me tell you, this drives me crazy when I see this. Pull your hair back, pull your hair back when you're working in the laboratory. <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> um, I teach in so many different laboratories. I always carry with me a container of, um, of hair bands <laughs> in case anybody forgot one. I always have them available for people. All right, let's look at these images here. Over here, we have someone who's working in a BSL-3 laboratory. The first thing that you notice is her PPE. She's also working in a biological hood. She's got this glass partition between herself and her workspace. There's only a few inches of it open, just enough for her hands to go through. But you are struck by her PPE. She's wearing a full gown over her clothing. She's got mask, she's got hairnet. She is more, much more tightly um, protected in terms of her body. Um, and she's keeping her work inside this contained sterilized space. Over here, we have someone in BSL-4. So this person is wearing this enclosed suit and this red uh, twisted coil device over here, this is delivering air into her suit. So she's got a face shield in front of her. This whole suit is a self-contained environment for her. Now she's also in a cabinet. She's also working in this protected space, but she is protected much more than this person is because of that suit. This person is handling novel, dangerous, respiratory pathogens that have no treatment, no vaccine available. Now, regardless of which kind of laboratory you work in, BSL-1 through BSL-4, we still stay focused on those two goals. Keep the culture or the diagnostic sample from contaminating you and keep yourself from contaminating the culture or the sample. We don't wanna move microbes around. We wanna grow purposefully what we wanna grow without contaminating it. And we wanna keep ourselves safe. All of our personal items are out of the workspace. We clean, we clean, we clean. We disinfect before we work. We disinfect after we work. Make sure those paper towels end up in the trash. Wash your hands when you get to work. Wash your hands when you leave work all kinds of things that are being done to keep our work safe and to keep ourselves safe. 
Any questions? Any questions about those BSL levels? Yeah, there's a BSL-4 lab down in Boston. And uh, when it was built, people were very, very concerned, as you can imagine. Uh, the public was very concerned. Um, I can tell you personally, I would much rather have a BSL-4 lab in my neighborhood than a BSL-3, because the BSL-4 lab has a higher level of biosecurity. And both labs are handling things that are mm, quite dangerous. Yeah. It's important that we have these lab spaces because it's important that we're able to study these dangerous pathogens. We needed a place to study SARS-CoV-2. We needed to be able to do that so that we could learn how to fight back, so that we could develop vaccines. Um, and you have to have those lab spaces available in order to do that. Amy's asking about regulations. So as you can imagine, these labs are very carefully monitored. There are people who, whose entire job it is to make sure that the rules are being followed in these labs and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention also monitors. So in these BSL-4 labs, and again, there aren't very many of them, they are in very close contact with the Centers for Disease Control. And, and everything they do is monitored and recorded um, just in case, just in case there's an accident. The Centers for Disease Control knows exactly which types of microbes are in which labs at the moment, how much of that material is in those labs and who's handling it. Okay. In the microbiology lab, we're gonna be talking about the different kinds of equipment that we use that's specific to microbiology because uh, most of what we're doing in the lab is moving microbes. We're moving, particularly bacteria, from one place to another. Um, it's important that we remember that because there are microbes everywhere, there are microbes all over us and in us, there are also microbes all over our environment. We have to assume that any work, any workspace, any work surface is contaminated, potentially contaminated. We have to act as though everything is contaminated and treat it that way. So that means that when we're working with equipment, we have to um, sterilize that equipment before we touch it to our cultures. Um, and we certainly wouldn't place that equipment down on our work surface if it's sterilized. You would never take a sterile instrument and place it down on your desktop because you have thus contaminated that sterile piece of equipment. One of the pieces of equipment we use the most is called an inoculating loop. And this is a piece of equipment that allows us, again, to pick up microbes from one location and move them to another location. This is the most handled piece of equipment in a micro lab, and we are constantly sterilizing it. We use it, then we sterilize it. Then we use it, then we sterilize it. And we have to be careful that we don't place a sterile loop onto something that's potentially contaminated. We also have to be careful that we don't place a contaminated loop down onto our work surface because we've just contaminated it. So these are the kinds of things that we have to constantly be thinking about. What is sterile and what is not sterile in the environment around me? We use, again, Bunsen burners for the sterilization purposes. We use these uh, tools called incinerators. You can even find alcohol lamps in some laboratories. And all an alcohol lamp is, is a lamp that burns alcohol instead of burning natural gas. A Bunsen burner burns natural gas. An alcohol lamp burns alcohol. In both cases, you've got an open flame. And that's what is so hazardous. Incinerators don't use an open flame but they are still hazardous because it's this little instrument that is very, very hot. 
So we have to be very careful not to accidentally touch the incinerator and burn ourselves. Again, we're not in the laboratory this summer, but we're gonna be pretending we are. We're gonna be looking at lots and lots of images of culture containers, Petri dishes, like this one over here in this image, and test tubes and flasks that contain material that specifically helps microbes to grow. It specifically helps bacteria to grow. We must never, ever handle a culture container like a dish or a test tube, unless we're wearing gloves. We always wanna keep our test tubes upright in a rack so that they, they can't accidentally spill. We always wanna keep our Petri dishes closed unless we are specifically needing to touch the microbes. Here's something else that I'll mention today, but we'll be talking about it again and again this summer. When we are finished working with a Petri dish and we put it back in the incubator to keep it warm so the microbes will be nice and happy, you always put them into the incubator upside down. Now that seems really strange. You take this Petri dish that has some solid culture media in it, something that we call agar, you put the cover on the dish and you put it in the incubator, but you put it in upside down. <laughs> and the reason for this is because the incubator is warm and also humid. You have to keep a certain level of humidity in an incubator to allow bacteria to grow optimally. And if you leave the dish right side up, so the lid is on top, what happens is you get condensation forming inside the lid and those drops of con condensation will fall down onto your bacteria. And that will dilute out what's growing and it will cause you problems. So we always put our dishes in upside down. And that way any condensation stays at the bottom, stays on the lid at the bottom and our bacteria don't get drowned in condensation. Just a little, uh, a little something for today about growing uh, bacteria in the lab. When we're finished with culture containers, all of them, all of them have to go into this uh, instrument called the autoclave. The autoclave is going to use heat and pressure to sterilize and kill all of those microbes so that we can dispose of them safely in the trash. Autoclave bags are specially made. They all have this symbol on them to alert people that they contain potentially biohazardous material. These bags get filled up with old con culture containers. They go into the microwave and they get sterilized before they are disposed of. Now, the last couple of things we'll talk about today, um, again, are just for general knowledge. Um, we're not in the laboratory, so these don't really apply. But when you're in a micro lab, if you do accidentally spill a culture, if you do accidentally spill a culture, you don't panic, okay? Even if you spill a culture that contains a pathogen, you don't panic, you simply cover it with paper towel and let the paper towel soak up the culture liquid. And then we pick up that paper towel and we put it in the autoclave bag. That's gonna leave a spot on the floor that needs to be disinfected. So we spray that with alcohol or again with bleach and we disinfect it. So even in labs that handle uh, dangerous pathogens, a spill is not a disaster. If you're using, if you're growing microbes in a liquid, again, what we call a broth, and that liquid spills, we just soak it up with paper towel, then put that paper towel in an autoclave bag so we can uh, sterilize it. 
before we throw it out. And then we simply spray our disinfectant solution over that spot and kill any microbes that might be remaining. If you drop a Petri dish on the floor, it's not a problem because the Petri dish has a solid media in it. So it's not gonna spill. Couple other things to remember. Most microbes, remember, are not pathogens. We talk about this in the first lecture. Remember, something between one and 5% of bacteria are pathogens. That's it. The rest of them are actually harmless to us or even helpful for us. Remember, those bacteria that live on us and in us are part of our microbiome. They are part of what keeps us healthy and they are not to be feared. But, but when we are in the laboratory, we treat all microbes as though they are pathogens. When you are in the laboratory and you are purposefully growing bacteria, you treat it as though it's harmful. You handle it with great respect as though it's harmful. And that way, if you ever are handling a pathogen, you're handling it correctly. In a diagnostic laboratory, when you get patient samples brought in and those patient samples need to have cultures made or otherwise be evaluated, we always treat them as though they had pathogens in them so that we can be as safe as possible at all times. Now, anybody have any questions? Any questions at all about anything I've said today? Hopefully you're getting the sort of overall message that Everything we do in the lab, we try to do as safely as possible. We try not to take risks because that's when accidents happen, when people get sort of, you know, lax about what they're doing, that's when accidents happen. We dress to be safe, we behave to be safe, and we try to prevent as much as possible. But the truth is most of the bacteria that we use and even the viruses that we grow and we work with in laboratories, um, they're not harmful to us. They're just, um, you know, they're just microbes. We shouldn't fear microbes. But when you are in a healthcare setting, especially when you're handling samples that come directly from patients, you must, you must behave as though they are dangerous pathogens, because you never know. You never know when one of them might be. So as long as you treat everything as though it's a pathogen, you'll be safest. All right. Now, the other part of the laboratory that we have today is about the care and use of a compound light microscope. Now, what I've done for you is I've prepared a short video that I've posted up on our YouTube playlist called The Care and Use of the Microscope. It's about 20 minutes long, I think. And all it is is a, a narrated tour of the parts of the microscope. So I want you to take a look at that when you have a moment. The other thing I posted for you last night is a handout that lists all of those pieces and parts and a description of what, they, what they're used for on the microscope. Um, that handout is, um, is what you'll wanna learn for um, the exam, the lab practical exam when it arrives. Again, many of us have handled microscopes and we're comfortable with microscopes, but if you haven't, if you haven't, hopefully this handout will help you um, learn the names of all the pieces and parts. Modern microscopes, modern microscopes are called 
compound because they have multiple lenses on them. In the old days, you had one, you had one objective lens. You also only had one eyepiece in those days. You had to look through with one eye. But modern microscopes are compound. They have multiple objective lenses and two eyepieces. They're binocular. These microscopes vary depending on which company produced them, but they all have the same basic equipment on them. And that's what you'll find on this handout. So let's take a look at this for just a minute. Here it is. So you should be seeing the handout on your screen now. You can see the first, um, the first thing talks about removing the microscope from the cabinet. Again, if you don't have experience with this, you might just grab the microscope and not give it a lot of thought. But microscopes are very unwieldy. They're not, their weight is not distributed evenly. So we always carry a microscope with one hand holding the arm and the other hand under the base. And we always grasp it and hold it up against our body because they are heavy and the weight is not evenly distributed through the microscope. Uh, we never drag a microscope across a surface. You never just slide a microscope across a surface because it will cause internal vibrations that will damage it. So these are just little tips about handling the microscope. Then there's a couple of labeled images for you that talk about the pieces and parts. Here's another one. And then I've got this sort of a tutorial. It's a list of the uh, parts of the microscope that I want us to know. And as you identify each one, you can just check it off at home, okay? There's a couple of highlighted things to pay attention to. Here's one that's very important. Modern compound light microscopes have high power oil immersion lenses on them. These, these lenses magnify a hundred times and they are designed to be used with oil. In other words, the lens has to be sitting in a drop of oil on top of the slide in order for you to see appropriately. These lenses are designed so that if there's oil on the slide, the lens will slide into place without any problems. If there is no oil on the slide and you slide that lens in place, you'll scratch it because it comes in right on top of the glass slide. So we always, always make sure there's oil before we rotate that lens into place. The other thing I've noted here is that you can only clean objective lenses with specialized paper and specialized cleaning fluid. In other words, you don't ever use paper towel to clean a lens. You don't ever use a Kim wipe to clean a lens. You have to use specialized lens paper so you don't scratch it. We also use a specialized cleaning solution because that won't scratch or damage the lens. Microscopes are fragile and microscopes are expensive. A typical compound light microscope is gonna run about three to $4,000. So we take care of them. This is um, the third part is a description of how you examine a slide. How do we examine some bacteria that we've put on a slide? And you'll notice that I have step-by-step -step directions here. Again, we're not in the laboratory this summer, but I would like you to know how you focus a microscope. And it's actually pretty basic. Um, the key thing is that you um, do this the same way every single time you examine something. You do the exact same steps. And that way you get very, very good, very quickly at focusing a microscope. Where students have problems focusing a microscope is when they just sort of jump in and they use any old lens 
and they try to find the object on the slide. You, you will almost never have success doing that. So I'm gonna let all, you're gonna let you read this on your own. Um, you'll notice that there are also instructions for how you put a microscope away. The key thing to remember when you use a microscope, whether it's in a college situation or at work, is that you will never have your own microscope at work. You will always be using a microscope that everybody's using. And so I always tell students, just remember the golden rule. Put the microscope away in a, in a way that you would want to find it if you were the next person to use it. Make sure it's put away correctly. Make sure it's put away clean and ready to be used again. Because if you're the next person to use it, you're going to appreciate that. So take a look at that video on our YouTube playlist called Care and Use of the Microscope and use that handout as a study guide for yourself in terms of what you need to know about microscopes for our lab. And of course, if you have any questions, jot them down. If anything's confusing, just jot down your, your questions. You can either message me or you can bring them to lab next time. Now, I made a change to our uh, syllabus. Um, if you looked at our syllabus last week, for example, there's a change in our schedule now, and that's because I forgot to include Memorial Day. I forgot that Memorial Day is on Monday. Silly me. I forgot that we have a holiday on Monday, so we're not going to be meeting for lab on Monday. Um, if you pull up our tentative schedule on the syllabus, or if you take a look at the to-do list for this week, I'm sorry, for next week, uh, that'll be reflected there. So I won't see you on Monday. You still have plenty of work to do. You still have lots of things to, to do for the week. You have lectures to view, and you have um, preparations to make for our first lecture exam. Now I'm gonna pull our uh, syllabus up for just a minute. Actually, I think I'm gonna pull up our Canvas page instead. We took a look at week one, remember? I'm gonna scroll down to week two. So you can see now in week two, if you go down to laboratory, it says for Monday, no lab, because it's Memorial Day. On Wednesday, we will be having a laboratory. We will be um, doing an exercise on examining living microbes and how we do that. And there'll be a laboratory homework assignment associated with that. So that's what's happening in lab next week. But if you look up in lecture, you have your first exam. It came up very quickly, didn't it? We have one lecture topic next week and that's the cell. So there's one lecture video, or I should say one set of videos to watch on YouTube about the cell. Here's the quiz for the cell. This is due on Wednesday. Again, remember, typically you'll, you'll have a quiz due on Wednesday and a quiz due on Friday. And then you can see you've got your first lecture exam. Now, don't worry too much about this lecture exam in terms of what it's going to be like. It's going to be a lot like the quizzes. It's going to be a lot like those lecture quizzes. Part of the reason we use lecture quizzes in this course is so you can see the kinds of questions I ask, how I ask them. So just like in the quizzes, you might be asked to choose a term to complete a statement. You might be asked to uh, tell whether or not something is true or false. You might be asked to um, um, choose a term from a pair of terms, which one is correct. The same types of questions that I ask on quizzes are the types of questions that you're gonna see on the exam. Now the exam is worth 80 points. And typically there will be between 25 and 30 questions on an exam. 
I give you 90 minutes to take an exam. Once you sit down and begin it, you have to complete it. And you can only submit it one time. So you'll wanna make sure that you're ready before you sit down and take the exam. But you have a whole, uh, a whole range of time to find the appropriate time for yourself. In week two, the exam is gonna become available to you Thursday morning. So at eight o'clock Thursday morning, the, you, can, you can take the exam if you're ready <laughs> and that time works out for you. The exam remains open until Sunday night at midnight. Here, let me pull it up again. Just to make sure I'm not speaking out of turn. So I'm gonna click on this right now. This exam, like all of your exams, is, uh, requires you to use the Respondus Lockdown Browser. So when you're ready to take the exam, you're gonna go to your computer, you're gonna open up the Lockdown Browser, and then you're gonna open up Canvas, and then click on the exam. If you try to open up the exam using any old browser, using Firefox or Safari or something like that, you're not gonna be able to. You're gonna be directed to go through the lockdown browser, okay? Remember, exams are closed note, closed book. You're gonna have 90 minutes to complete it once you begin. Now, what if you need more than 90 minutes? You'll be able to go past 90 minutes if you need it. It's just that you might lose points. That's at my discretion, by the way. So, you know, if a person goes over the 90 minutes by, let's say, three or four minutes, I'm not going to take any extra points off. But if you take two hours or maybe, you know, two and a half hours to complete the exam, you're going to lose some points for that. That tells me that you weren't prepared for the exam. In my experience with students, most students take between 30 and 60 minutes to finish this exam. Somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes to finish. And you have 90 minutes. So again, if a student takes two hours to complete it, that's a sign to me that they really weren't prepared. They didn't know the material well enough at that point. Sorry, I misspoke earlier. That's why I wanted to pull this up. It's due Saturday by midnight, not Sunday by midnight. So it opens up at 8 a.m. on Thursday morning. And it is due by Saturday at midnight. So you can take it any time during that time interval. If you wanna take it on Thursday, if you wanna take it on Friday, if you wanna take it on Saturday. Now, if there's anybody in here who has a problem timing the exam, send me a message, okay? Send me a message. If there's something going on in your life, that's gonna make it hard for you to get that exam done on Thursday or Friday or Saturday, send me a message, okay? And we'll work it, we'll work it out. But hopefully among those three days, you'll be able to find a time to take it. Just make sure, just make sure that you get it into me before Saturday at midnight, okay? There's one last thing that you'll see and that's this, if you encounter any problems during the exam, every once in a while, as we all know, Wi-Fi kicks out. If you get kicked out of the exam, if your Wi-Fi goes out, if something happens, don't panic, okay? Don't panic. We're gonna figure it out. You're just gonna wanna send me a message, again, through the Canvas inbox. Do that immediately and I'll help you figure out a plan to get through the exam, okay? 
I don't ever want to hear that anyone panicked about anything this summer. All right. We will work it out. We'll figure it out. Okay. So there are three subjects on this first exam. And those are the three lecture topics that, that you will have done by then. Introduction to the microbes, history of microbiology, and microscopy, and the cell. There'll be three lecture topics. Nothing from the laboratory will be on the lecture exam. Okay, laboratory and lecture are separate in this class. So between now and next Thursday, or whenever you take the exam, if you have questions about the lecture material, let me know. Send me a message and we'll talk about it, okay? <clears throat> all right. All right, that's all I have for you today. Remember, no lab on Monday, that's Memorial Day. Everybody needs to, to, to take a little time, <laughs> do something fun. <laughs> I will see you on Wednesday morning next week. Okay? Keep in touch if you need me. And I'll see you then. Enjoy the good weather. Enjoy the good weather. <laughs> I'll see you later, you guys. <laughs>